Bruchem Aboim. Thank you very much for coming. Again, welcome to our home. Um, tonight, the uh, topic on my thoughts will be wells in the Torah. You know, we read in the Torah, <clears throat> excuse me, that both Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father, and Yitzchak Avinu, and Jacob our father, pardon me, Isaac our father, both dug wells. We know the Torah is stingy with words. So why is this fact that they dug wells important for us to know? The Torah tells us that when Yitzchak came to live in the Valley of Gror, he once again dug up the wells that his father Avram had dug. These wells were filled with earth by the Pelishtim, by the Philistines, after Avram Vinu, Abraham our father, died, based on the premise that they would be, may be used by invading armies. Yitzchak, his son, redug them and called them with the exact same names that his father had called them. Now, the first well that he reopened is called Esek, which in, he, which in Hebrew, which means coral. He called this well Esek because the Philistines contended with him concerning this well. The second well he redug, he called Sitna, meaning hatred. It is interesting that if you move the last letter, He, to the beginning of the word, it spells the word Hasutton, the devil. When he moved from there, he dug another well, but this time, the Philistines did not contend with him at all, and he called it Rechovot, meaning wide and expansive. And as the verse states in Toldos 26-22, for now God had made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Now the three wells the Yitzhak dug represent the three temples, the first two temples, were destroyed as were, the, pardon me, the first two wells were destroyed as were the first two temples. However, the third well prevailed. And this is a sign for us that the third temple will stand forever, may be built quickly and in our time based on Achidah. What we find interesting in these verses is that when the Torah refers to the digging of the first two wells, it uses the plural form, the word Vayach Peru, and they dug. In both instances, uh, they were not successful. However, with the digging of the third well, now the Torah uses a singular word, Vayach Por, and he dug. The wording is an illusion to tell us that there was no contention over this well at all, and so they were successful. Singularity, Achtut, meaning unity. Unity brings with it success and division, brings with it failure. Now Yitzchak then traveled to Be'er Sheba, where God communicated with him in the merit of his father Avram. God told Yitzchak not to fear, for he would be with him and bless him and multiply his seed, all for the sake of Avram his servant. Hearing these promises, Yitzchak built an altar and sacrificed to God. He pitched his tent there and his servants dug a fourth well. This well was, was the seventh well that was dug. There were the three wells that his father had dug and the Philistines had plugged up. He then redug those three and then added a seventh well, which accounts for the name Be'er Sheva, which in Hebrew means the seventh well. Yitzchak dug many wells until he dug the seventh well and was successful. So too with learning Torah, which we compare to water. Sometimes, wasn't, sometimes one doesn't find success immediately but one should persevere until they finally do. We find the same scenario in life. You know, sometimes one has to try different things until one finds their true mazel, based on a Chafetz Chaim. This all seems like a nice story, but we know that under the surface of these stories, there are many hidden meanings. It states in Ituri Torah that the three wells that the servants of Yitzchak dug correspond to three character traits. The traits of chesed, kindness, gevura, severity, and teferis, beauty or truth. Now the trait of chesed, kindness, is part of all humanity. Even the nations of the world identify with it. And so, the shepherds of Gor contended with the shepherds of Yitzchok. There was also contention over the second well, which alludes to the trait of gevura, severity, because this trait can also be found amongst the nations of the world. However, the third well that Yitzhak dug alludes to the trait of Tiferis, and this trait 
God gave only to the children of Israel. And that was the reason that there was no contention concerning it, because no other nation has a portion in it. In addition, the three wells allude to, again to the three temples. There are two phases in digging a well. First, the actual work of digging the hole, and then the filling of the hole with water. Now, the digging requires an act of man, whereas the water comes as an act of nature. And so, too, with the two temples. The actual physical structure was built by acts of man, but the dwelling of the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, came through an act of God as a direct consequence of the building of the temples. This analogy is true for the first two temples. But what about the third temple, which is Zohar, states will be built by God Almighty himself and not man. Now, even according to the Zohar, the third temple will require some human interaction. However, not in the usual physical sense of bricks and mortar, but rather in the spiritual sense of Torah and mitzvot. So the Zohar is telling us that each mitzvah that we perform is like adding another brick to the third temple, and each sin that we commit is like removing another brick. And that is why when it is completed, it will be eternal, based on the Ramban. Now the Kliyakar states that the first wall was a sign of Essek, quarrels. It was an allusion to the wars that would exist between the kingdom of Judah, Yehuda, and the kingdom of Yisrael of Israel during the first temple era. Now the division of the nation occurred after the death of Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, when Yeruvim ben Nevat took ten tribes and established what he called Malchus Yisroel, the kingdom of Israel. The second wall was, well, pardon me, was called Sitna, hatred, which alludes to the second temple era. The second temple was destroyed because of the sin of Sinas Chinam, baseless hatred. There was hatred and dissension that existed among the people of that time. The temple and the city were destroyed by the Romans only because the zealots destroyed all the provisions that were stored in the city. They forced the people to battle with the Romans, which brought about the destruction of the city, the temple, and the ultimate exile of the nation. Rabbeinu Bachai states that the walls were only a metaphor. They alluded to the many converts that Avram and Sarah drew near to God during their lifetimes. After Avramavino's death, the Philistines were able to draw these people back to their pagan ways. After a while, though, Yitzhak was finally able to succeed in bringing those converts back to the proper path. When they returned, he gave them the same names that his father Avramavino had given them before. Now the Zohar states that because the Philistines stopped up the wells, mankind was bent on returning to serving idols. There was a fear that the name of God was in danger of being forgotten again. And when Yitzhak redug these wells, he restored the knowledge that there is a God in the world, again, based on Excel, the Akabola. Now, the Hebrew words Mayim, water, and Torah are connected. They represent many of the same ideas. They both have the ability to make things grow, water in a physical sense, and Torah in a spiritual sense. Without water, the world could not exist, and so too. Without the Torah, the world could not exist. Water flows from above to below, as does Torah that comes from heaven and then descends upon the earth. Water is similar to sperm in that it impregnates the earth, causing things to grow. The same thing can be said for the Torah when one internalizes its message. Water in the form of rain descends onto this earth. The Hebrew word for rain is geshem. We refer to physicality of this world as gashmias, physicality. When the rain falls, it doesn't enter the fruit or leaves or branches or trunk or even the roots. The rain enters Mother Earth physically, and then it nurtures the tree through its roots. The Medrash tells us that before God created this universe, he looked into the Torah, and then he created this world. Torah is the blueprint of our universe. It enters into this world as a spiritual entity. It is then internalized into the mind of a person 
where it is transformed into motivation for physical actions. It is this physical action which brings about a relationship, a, a partnership of sorts, between man and his creator. The last word in the narrative of creation is la'asos, to do. This is a world of action. God expects us to be active partners with him in the creation of his world. Now, the Hebrew word for a well is be'er. It is spelled bet, aleph, and resh. And these three letters are an acronym for the words, biyadacha avkid ruhi, in your hand, I entrust my spirit. This is an allusion to the spiritual nature of water and its connection to God Almighty. Now, even the Hebrew word mayim is an allusion to the depth and sanctity of the Torah. The word is spelled mem, yud, and a final mem. And we know that Moshe was on the mountain to receive the Torah from God Almighty three times. Twice, he was there to receive the Torah, and once, to pray for forgiveness of the nation for the making of the golden calf. He was on the mountain twice to receive the Torah, and each time for a period of 40 days. While on the mountain, God taught him the whole Torah and then sent him down to, with the carrying the Ten Commandments. The gematria, the numerical value of the letter Mem, is 40, an allusion to both 40-day periods that he spent on the mountain. And the numerical value of the letter Yud is 10, an allusion to the Ten Commandments, which he brought down with him. Now, the first mem in the word mime is open, and the last mem is closed. Both of these letters are an allusion to both the revealed and concealed aspects of Torah. The yud in the middle of the word is an allusion to the Torah which Moshe brought down from heaven. Our sages tell us that God created the heavens with the Hebrew letter yud. Now, the Hebrew letter yud is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Its size is significant. It tells us, that God is humble and desires anything that has humility. On contrast, he abhors anything that has ego, arrogance. In fact, the word ego is an acronym for easing God over. The way for one to draw water from a well is with a bucket. In Hebrew, the word for bucket is deli. It is also a word used to describe a very poor man. When a person exhibits humility, dal, then they can draw from the well springs of Torah, alluded to by the word Mayim. As we say in our morning prayers before we begin the Amida, the standing prayer, it states that Mashbil Geim Ade Oritz and Magbia Shvalim Ade Maro, that he, God, humbles the arrogant to the ground and then raises the lowly to supreme heights. I also found it interesting that according to Wikipedia, 71% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. Now, the number 71 is very significant and that it is connected to Judaism and the Torah. We read that in the desert, Moshe, our teacher, appoints 70 Zikanim, elders, to assist him in judging the people. 70 plus the one himself is 71. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Supreme Court, consisted of 71 members. And even though today there are 193 nations, who are members in the United Nations. According to the Torah, there are 70 root nations with the children of Israel counted as the 71st. These 70 nations trace their origin back to the 70 souls that God dispersed throughout the world after they built the Tower of Bubble. They were known as the Dor Haflaga, the generation of dispersion. Now we also read in the Torah that there were 70 souls that accompanied Yaakov, our father, when he came down to Egypt with his family to see Yosef. Wells and water are found throughout the Torah, beginning with the creation of the world and the splitting of the upper and lower waters, then the flood which God used to destroy the earth and all of its inhabitants. The only ones who survive were those who were with Noah and the ark. We read the story of Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, who finds Yitzchak's wife Rivka at a well, as does Yaakov, when he comes to Lovin's house looking for a wife. Moshe's life and his death were closely related to both the Torah and to water. It was he who was the ultimate teacher of the Torah. In fact, the Torah is referred to as Torah Moshe, the Torah of Moshe. 
His life began with his cradle being floated in the Nile. He met his wife, Sipora at a well. He split the sea and then marched the newly freed nation of Israel through the dry seabed. He brought water out from a rock that traveled with them for the duration of the 40 years in the wilderness. At the end of the 40 years in the desert, Miriam died. It was in her merit that the Jews were given water during their 40 years in the wilderness. In fact, that rock, which was referred to as Be'er Miriam, the well of Miriam, after her death, the water ceased. So then Moshe, commanded by God, was told to talk to the rock so that it would bring forth water once again. But in his anger, Moshe hit the rock. He was punished by God Almighty for his action and was not permitted to enter the land of Canaan with the nation. Now the birth of the world originated with the earth covered with water. <clears throat> this is similar to the state of a fetus in its mother's womb before she gives birth. Our sages tell us that the baby is taught all of the Torah by an angel while it is still in its mother's womb. During the whole pregnancy, the fetus is surrounded by water. This is an allusion to Torah seen as the building blocks of creation. And just as a person cannot live physically more than three days without water, so too on a spiritual level, it is detrimental for the soul to exist without Torah for three days. So Moshe instituted that the Torah should be read by the congregation at least once every three days. This fact is alluded to in the words that we say in the evening prayer. Ki heim chayenu the orach yamenu. For they are our life and the length of our days. The gematria of the word mayim is 90. I have stated many times that the number nine is allusion to truth. Nine times any number always comes back to nine. We have been told by our sages that God created this world with ten character traits. So nine times ten is an allusion to God creating this world with truth and all of these ten character traits. Again, the miracle value of ninety. So water is a component of all things in creation. Even inanimate objects such as rocks contain water. Fruits and vegetables are made up of 89% water. We as human beings are made up of 55 to 60% of water. As it states in Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein, the world and that they dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Water is also the chemical most mentioned in the Torah. It has a number of physical and chemical properties that make it unique and necessary for all living things. And just like water exists and is, is essential to all living things in creation, so too the Torah and the godly sparks that reside therein are essential to all that exists in creation. Now some of these sparks are open and obvious, like rivers and seas. Others are hidden deep within the earth like fountains and wells. The written Torah is open and obvious, whereas the oral Torah, is hidden deep within the words and letters of the words of the written Torah, transmitted to us by Moshe, our teacher. Though neither water nor Torah has any color or taste, still they are both the building blocks of creation. We may not appreciate their importance to our daily lives, yet without these two, we would not be able to exist on either a physical or spiritual level. So let us live a healthier life, physically and spiritually, by internalizing the required dosage of water and Torah each and every day. And with that, may we herald in the coming Mashiach Sekenu quickly and in our time. Again, I want to thank you for attending and listening. Uh, again, may God bless you with good health and safety and uh, happiness. And uh, again, look forward to doing this again next week. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you again.